Good evening and welcome to this Norfolk Wildlife Trust Ply Calling event. We're delighted to have you with us from all around the world. This of course is a free event. Now, though it's a free event, this has been a tough year for all conservation organisations. So should you be so inspired to make a donation, Norfolk Wildlife Trust would be delighted to receive it. And the link to where you can make a donation has already been sent to you in an email with your link to this event. It will also be popping up in the chat at the side of our event this evening, and you will receive a thank you email, which again has the link to which you can go to make a donation Thank you very much to Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And it also will include the link to purchase Roy's latest book. So of course, this evening we're talking to Roy Dennis. I'll bring him in in just a moment. And he has recently published this charming set of essays, Cotton Grass Summer, with 52 essays on his life in conservation, reflections on rewilding and reintroductions, on the future of the British landscape and its past, and the role of many animals including ourselves in that landscape i've thoroughly enjoyed reading it and encourage you to purchase it and you can do so from our partners wild sounds and books and again the link to purchase roy's latest book will be in the email you've already been sent the email you will receive and also in the chat so you have no excuse for not purchasing Roy's charming book. And by doing so through the link, Wild Sounds and Books will generously make a 10% donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, for which we thank them very much indeed. If there are any technical issues, we have David Fieldhouse, the wonderful David Fieldhouse, who's our education officer at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, Cly Marshes, behind the scenes, and we hope he will deal with anything. If we do, for some reason, lose the transmission, we will come back. So please go back to the email you already have and follow the same link again and that should bring you back to our conversation. And if for some reason you have to drop out, the whole thing will later be loaded to YouTube where you can watch this conversation, but you can also watch previous conversations, for example, with Tim D a couple of weeks ago on his book Greenery and prior to that with Patrick Barkham on his fantastic book Wild Child. Now, there is a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen I believe you can click on this and there's your opportunity to ask a question. Now Roy has a long and illustrious career in conservation, in rewilding, in reintroductions and has many many important ideas. If you have questions please do ask. There are lots of you present this evening and we are really really delighted by that which means that we may well not get to everyone's questions so it's a good idea to get them in early and I will either read your questions to Roy or alternatively um, we might bring some of you in briefly um, and when we bring you in you'll just quickly get the chance to speak to Roy and then we'll fade you out again. Uh, David we're being asked whether we can post the link to the past conversation so that would be a helpful thing to do so thank you very much for that question just before I bring in Roy thank you very much for listening to me for so long sorry about that we have another of these events on the 10th of September with Dr Erica McAllister who is a fantastic and fascinating academic at the Natural History Museum who has devoted her life to the study of flies so whereas this evening we're talking about big animals big landscape big process we'll be focusing right down on the intimate lives of flies and Erica has brought out a new book called The Inside and Out of Flies and we'll be talking about that with her on the 10th of September. However this evening we're here to talk to Roy Dennis and I'm delighted to bring him into the conversation. Good evening Roy, how are you? Very well, good to see you. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, your book, which, as I say, people can purchase through the link, which is in the chat, so please, please do. Um, your book, Cotton Grass Summer, has a very charming title, and indeed the first essay touches on the subject of cotton grass, and it's clear that it's been a part of your life for a long time. So, so what's the why and wherefore of the title of your book? Well, I just like the title, but it's also the plant that kind of shows us that spring is on the way in the highlands of Scotland. The first little grey shoot comes out of the moss 
and you know that spring is on the way and the locals call it moss crop and it's the first thing that sheep and deer and capercaillies and black grouse can eat in the spring and it has I think a real significance and it's also a great indicator of whether land is overgrazed or in good ecological health. It's a marvellous, beautiful way of knowing what's happening. And by chance, this summer or spring was the most fantastic display of these beautiful white willowy cotton buds kind of across the countryside that's ever occurred in my lifetime. And also talking to older keepers and shepherds, they've never seen it as good as this year. And do you have a feeling for, without giving away too much of our conversation that's to come, do you have a feeling for why this year has been a spectacular bloom of cotton grass? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I, knew you, I knew you'd ask me that. So I, I phoned up my best kind of botanist friend and said, look, I'm going to be asked this question this evening. What do I say? And they said, hmm. You could talk about the weather last year or the rainfall or whatever, uh, but we probably don't know. No, how fascinating. Now, one or two times this evening, I've got lots of quotations from your book that struck me as particularly interesting or profound or things which prompt thought. So I'll just read you something, so your own words, um, which come from the book, but on this very subject. Too many deer or sheep mean that flowering plants are scarce, so an abundance of cotton grass in bloom in boggy areas is a real marker of successful ecological recovery. For me, it's the perfect mix of beauty and utility, showing us what we're doing right in the simplest and prettiest way. And that comes right at the start of the book and is really a, an opening to the thoughts that then follow. So it's a, an introduction. Now, in a sense, all of the essays in your book are about landscape. Now, some touch on deep landscape and its ancient history. Some touch on the future of landscape and how we bring about healthier landscape. Some are personal reflections, observations of individual animals at particular times, some very, very rare, some common species. Um, but it's all about landscape. So I wondered, you, your whole career has been devoted to the conservation of wildlife and to landscape. So give us a background, if you would, Roy, of the state of the UK landscape in 2020 and how we have ended up where we are from a historic perspective. Well, I think the other one is, what are we going to do about it? So I've lived through my life and I remember when I first came to the Highlands in 1959-60, uh, I just saw these immense expanses of land in which I could wander and explore. And I wasn't really sure then of what it was all about. I thought it was great. And then slowly I started to read, you know, the works of people like Fraser Darling um, after the war. And, and Professor Stevens before in the 1930s. And, and it came very clear then that the landscape we see in Britain has been highly modified by humans on the low ground and highly modified by grazing and destruction of forests on the higher ground. And that is just not having our land in good ecological condition. And so it's been a thread of my life, but. It's only in recent years that I've seen that big, big change. Uh, and especially from big landowners suddenly saying, you know, we want to rewild our land. We want bigger reserves. And I, I remember I was still in the RSPB in the late eighties when the society purchased Abernethy Forest. And that was a big step for them. It was not a traditional reserve. It was big. It was difficult to manage and it was a big challenge. And fortunately, they took that challenge. Now in the intervening time, I don't think they've been bold enough. They've reduced the deer and you get regeneration, but I still think 
that we've got to do much more. You know, we've got to have the links back. We've got to have the beaver everywhere. We've got to recognize that these, what people call beautiful heather moors, are actually degraded landscapes. They are indeed. And right across, as you rightly say, right across the UK, we live in degraded landscapes and yet the vast majority of us, even those of us who are interested in conservation, we don't notice or we put it to the back of our minds. And one of the things you touch on is the idea of baseline creep. I'll just read you something from, from there. Each new generation of my nature loving friends accept lower experiences and expectations. It's called baseline creep. So that what we now we have now does not seem so bad if we compare it to the 1990s rather than to the 1960s. Talk us a little bit through this idea of baseline creep, because it really is important to what you've tried to achieve your entire life and indeed have achieved. I think it's that you have a situation where people want to do research on a particular animal or plant or community and are focusing down quite accurately on smaller numbers. And it's easier to get the data for 1990 than it is for 1960 or 1930 or 1860. And I think the problem is that the old naturalists were sometimes much wider in their thinking process. And so the baseline is easier to work on if it's closer to the period in which you work. And uh, I often quote that the professor of natural history in Aberdeen when I was 20 did his PhD on the seabirds of the North Atlantic Ocean. His best student later did it on the life history of the former. And as each generation has gone on, the object of study gets smaller and smaller. And yet at this period of time, we need people to think in much bigger ways about large landscapes, about the fact that we want big animals back, that uh, you know you can complain about the middle guild predators like badger, fox, um, pine martin and otter which impact a whole range of species and the thought that you suggest you reduce them immediately causes hassle but if you brought in wolf again and lynx then the situation would be different and the difference is how do you manage a situation where you cannot get the apex predators back? So I think it is baseline creep. You should recognize that although you can't get the information, say 40, 50 years back, you should bring it into your thinking. And it's bringing into your thinking. And my book, what I was trying to do was not suggest that everything was dire. There are real opportunities. There is really lots that young people can do. You know, for goodness sake, don't give up. And it is, there's more to do if you think of it in a big way. Now, that is extremely important and it's wonderful that you're thinking of, after your illustrious career, passing the torch on to young people because of course we do have dynamic young people who are, as the phrase goes, thinking like a mountain, which is what we all need to be doing. But just to touch on what you said about not giving up and persevering, well, before we came live, you were talking about a particular project this year, your, your white-tailed eagles in the Isle of Wight. Now we'll come on to the, we'll come back to the main discussion of rewilding, but you told me rather a charming anecdote about not giving up. Uh, what's been your experience with this year in the white-tailed eagles? Well, this was a very difficult year with lockdown because there were a lot of people that were extremely impacted on it and still are and still will be. Whereas I was, I'm living in, you know, kind of wild Murray and I can just walk out of my door and disappear into the forest and never meet anybody. But the impact was, would we be able to uh, get young white-tailed eagles this year? And we were advised early on, look, it's just going to be too difficult. And so I and Tim McCrill, who works with me, we said, we won't make a decision until the last moment, because we know 
that if the government changes the protocols on Monday, we could start doing it on Wednesday. So because we're very small, we could react very quickly. And fortunately, at that period, it was possible for us with the right protocols uh, to get on to Calmac Ferry and get to the Hebrides and collect some young. And so I'm delighted that there are seven new young ones flying around the Isle of Wight. How very exciting and congratulations to you. And we look forward to reading about their adventures. And I should just mention at this point that Roy has a blog on his website of the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation, which is roydennis.org. You can follow the fortunes of these wonderful birds that against all the odds have just been released back into the Isle of Wight. So many congratulations to you on that. But to go back to our discussion of cotton grass summer, a big, big theme is grazing and the differential really between very, very specialist grazers like deer, which we have allowed to become very popular through the absence of predators, and sheep, which don't belong here at all, and cattle. And you clearly have a great affinity with cattle, a love of cattle and an understanding of their role in our primeval forest and in the development of the forest. So I wondered if you'd touch on that. In fact, might I read to you first, those traditional cattle enhance the land in a most astonishing way because of their non-specialized grazing. Their dung and urine also fertilize the land and they left behind a network of tracks. The cattle recycled plant material, thus increasing plant biomass and diversifying plant communities. This kind of grazing on extensive pastures, near enough replicating that of aurochs, was very sympathetic with nature and enhanced biodiversity wonderfully. So, grazing. Give us some ideas on sheep, cattle and deer. Well, when you see the Scottish Highlands, you know, there have been millions of sheep grazed in the uplands of Britain and big fortunes made, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries and it was so such a big thing that the whole of the uplands was created to great you know grazy sheep all the vegetation bushy vegetation was removed any trees so that it didn't snag the wool and so you you were concentrating on this one animal and then the red deer in the recent 50 years have just increased and increased and they are selective grazers. They start with the nicest plants first and then work their way down to the poorest. And in many places now, it's only the poorest plants from a biological point of view that remain, sedges and poor grasses. Whereas the cattle, and I'm not talking about cattle, intensive cattle in fields, but things like Highlanders and Galloways and Aberdeen Angus crosses and that, they have a broad brush and they do two things. They, they change the ecotones in wooded landscapes and create glades on the best soils, which are important for insects and food for birds and animals. And they create wonderful roadways or tracks through the forests. So they're kind of essential. And it's how you get that back. And people often mistake grazing, you know, from one. And one of my friends once said, it's a bit like having a box of chocolates. And the sheep and the deer are always pick the nicest ones first. And then they leave you with the Turkish delight at the end, or whatever you don't particularly like. Whereas a cow would just start anywhere and eat any of them. And it is that selectivity that's the problem. Yeah, so you advocate cattle as part of the solution to dynamic uh, regenerative woodlands in the Highlands and indeed across the UK. Yeah, and it, it, I guess at the beginning, they should be in all the rewilding areas, they should be in all the nature forests, but they have to be uh, traditional cattle, which are not fed, they're not um, brought in, they live there all their lives, um, as they live through the year, they get bigger coats. They're more able to deal with poor quality vegetation. And I've become convinced that they shouldn't be within the human food chain. They mustn't be treated with ivermectins. 
That just kills all the bugs. People always laugh. Whenever I walk across a field of cows, I kick the cow pats. And most of them are not colonized nowadays by insects because they're poisonous. And we just cannot carry on like that in our nature areas. And of course, the very insects in the case of the flies, for example, that, um, that feed on the dung are, are the food of swallows and swifts and birds which are declining very significantly across the landscape and spotted flycatchers, for example. And it's by treating cattle that we are in fact reducing the numbers of those birds in addition to destroying their habitats. Yeah, and do you know, I'm not a scientist, but I, I wrote a paper in the late 80s about the value of cattle in forests. And I thought, I'm just going to do an easy sum. And I worked out that the invertebrates within a cow dung from one cow in a year equals a quarter to a third of her weight. Good grief. Yeah. Yes. No wonder you're surprised. It's a lot. <laughs> and the interesting thing was the people that took it up most were the farmers because it was a simple thing. Can you possibly imagine that the beetles and flies and worms equal one third of our weight? And that was where I recognize that stories have to be easily understood and too much of our work is too scientific, talking to our colleagues instead of the general public and failing to put it in a system in a way that everyone can understand. And your book is a series of stories, many of them very personal, which do bring these issues to light. Now, I'm going to take you now a little further afield, but to bring us back home, there is a myth in the UK that we have no space. There is a myth that we are unable to live alongside larger species that drive dynamism in landscape. And one of the things you do in your book is travel to Scandinavia, travel to the Carpathians, and then reflect on what life there and life alongside large animals means for the uplands and indeed in future perhaps the lowlands of Britain. So what is your reflection on that, Roy? Well, there. I'm a great believer that if you are interested in promoting a particular line, you should know as much about it as possible. You know, if you're interested in bringing back wolf or lynx or, you know, Dalmatian pelican or whatever, you should know about it. And I, I can think of a couple things. One of my friends in Norway was researching uh, red fox and uh, lynx and roe deer. And he told me, I was at a meeting with him in Spain, he said, we went to the den and we tagged the two kittens last week with the Minister of the Environment in Norway. And she was very impressed. I said, I'm impressed as well. Can I come with you next year? And he said, certainly, I will phone you and you need to get on the plane to Oslo. I got the phone call and I knew he lived further north in Trondheim. And I said, I'm happy to come to Trondheim. He said, no, just get off the plane in Oslo. He picked me up and within 10 miles of the city, I was shown these kittens. So when I look out of my window here, lynx could live there as easy as they can in Norway. And another friend, we went to see about white-tailed eagles a couple, two autumns ago in, in the Netherlands. And one of our friends took us to one of his friends in the Velu forest in the center Netherlands. And he said, you'll never believe this, Roy, a female wolf has arrived and she's denned not far from us. And now they've had young ones and that's in the Netherlands. And so you recognize that we have a very different view of some of these creatures, which somehow the young people have got to encourage people to recognize that what they think is incorrect. 
And you're so right that it is incorrect. Uh, we have this big bad wolf narrative as British people. I think it's because we're an island and for so very long, we've been able to hunt things out. We hunted out the bear and we clapped our hands. We applauded ourselves. We hunted out the lynx. We hunted out the wolf. We hunted out the beaver. Um, and we seem to think these animals are big and dangerous. And yet our European friends and neighbors are living alongside these animals with the wisdom of having done so for centuries and millennia. How do you feel we overcome that issue? I think now there's much more talking about it. There's much more recognition that it's no longer just about um, restoring rare animals or important animals. It's to do with our very life on this planet. You know, I don't see nature conservation not including me anymore, you know, as a person, as a human. As a human, we have to have a real functioning ecosystem. And we just cannot any longer do all the things that we did in the past. And part of that is having, you know, my view is that 50% of our land should be principally for ecological services, you know, creating oxygen, holding water, stopping flooding, in, increasing the numbers of insects, helping pollination, helping our health, everything. We just cannot carry on the way we've done it. No, absolutely so. And if I may read to you again from your, your own book, but the aim of rewilding is to restore nature and natural processes over much larger areas of land rather than concentrate on small nature reserves. It's also aimed at the whole ecosystem. So it's about functions as well as individual species. It's about restoring soils, vegetation, invertebrates, mammals and birds, as well as capturing carbon, producing oxygen, the natural management of water and local climate. It's truly about life on Earth, which is exactly what you've just been saying. Now, I'm going to come back at you with, here's Roy Dennis, this giant of reintroduction, and also a very pragmatic man. But I think you had a bit of a moment with those lynx kittens, because you wrote in the book, they were so beautiful and I was totally knocked out. I was allowed to hold them and after biometrics had been taken, along with blood samples, they were put back into their secure den. I just wished I could have hidden them in my pockets and taken them home to Scotland. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> uh, well, let's, let's hope then that um, in Roy Dennis's lifetime, he will be able to be instrumental in bringing lynxes back to the UK. But talk to us about another species. Among the, the big species, the ones with fangs, the ones who hunt, there's a lot of talk about them, but of course, the beaver is important in your book, but much more importantly, right across our landscape, the beaver is being recognized as a species which brings life, which generates habitat. So what's been your experience with them and what's your vision for them, Roy? I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see we have them back. I'm really pleased to see what's happening in England, where it seems to me now that the return of the beaver is just going to be a rolling process. I think, I think the evidence, not, you know, from the scientists who have looked at it, they, they've proved all the things that we said, you know, that they hold water, they purify water, they, they do everything that's on the can. Um, but the problem is, how do you get these things back when there's a lot of opposition? So in Scotland, you know, it's quite a disgrace that nearly a hundred beavers have been shot or killed since we made them a native animal. Now, I know the farmers are upset, but then some of us are upset that farmers are able to plow and plant crops within a meter or two of rivers. You know, you just have to say, we cannot have chemical runoff uh, going into our rivers and our estuaries. And so you'd say, you know, through farmland, there should be a 10 to 15 meter belt of scrub or willow or whatever have you. Then you wouldn't have beavers going into carrot fields. So it, the problem that the beaver is causing is actually showing that we're not 
looking after our land properly. Now it's very difficult that your ancestors carved this farm out. But as Fraser Darling said long ago, all because you did that doesn't mean that it has to be done forever. You know, or else we would still be baiting bears and lighting candles in the street. You know, we've got to move on and we've got to move on in the best ways for the whole of the environment and ourselves. And you make the point, in fact, you just touched on it, that we've allowed farmers to farm right up to within a metre of, of waterways. And as a result of that, we have agricultural runoff with both pesticides, but also nitrates and phosphates and so on going into the water. And this we, we kind of accept. And you make an interesting point um, in the book about the change in the, in a sense, the teeth of both statutory organisations and um, um, public funded organisations, um, that we've lost some of the strength that we have. So you say, why are demands for change not met nowadays? Are the conservation bodies less able or organised? Are the politicians more negligent? Or are the chemical companies in the farming industry much stronger? My very strong view is that we need immediate change rather than do more research. Government and big business love research. It means they don't have to do anything now. And nature, if given a chance, can bounce back. Yeah, I think, I think there is a problem. You know, when I worked for the RSPB, I worked for them from in the 1970s and 80s. And in the early 60s, I was a warden at Loch Garton. And we had some big fights then, you know, the, fountain, the forestry and the flow country and that, which on these deep peats, which we won. And we always felt then that we were like David fighting Goliath. And now the organizations are so big, they seem more worried about upsetting people. And the government bodies, and I, I put that back, unfortunately, to the flow country debate, where the Nature Conservancy, which was an all, all Britain organization, came down with the RSPB against the planting of Sitka spruce and lodgepole pine on those big lands, which was done for tax relief. That's where the money was. The money was a tax relief. And um, there was no doubt that members of government were really annoyed with the Nature Conservancy. And not long afterwards, it was cut up into an English body, a Scottish one, Scottish natural heritage, and then one in Wales. And I felt that was a real weakening of the real need to be tough on nature conservation in our country. I would like to see us go back to a much tougher I'd like them to be called, you know, Nature Conservancy or Natural Resources Department. They should be a department in their own right within government. They should have a, a, a minister at the table. This is really important stuff. It's fantastic. We have an advocate like you because so often nature conservation is subsumed in something else. It's belittled and we don't coherently make these arguments that our water, our oxygen, the ability of our landscape not to flood our homes, the quality of life that we enjoy through access to nature, all of these things depend on our living as human beings, as one species in a landscape, in contact with myriad other species which are all providing services for us. I think that's right, but I, I would also hope people would would read my book because there are some joyous essays in there you know about nice things as well because there is a lot of good stuff out there to talk about and um, you know my view when I wrote these books it, I was 80 this year and um, I thought I've got all these diaries I've kept a diary since I was a kid I kept all my field notebooks I have all my letters so this was a kind of getting me back into writing. And then in the spring is coming out a, a Collins book about all the reintroductions. And then I'm writing something about the fights we had 
you know, all the kind of arguments about skiing and mountains and ptarmigan and crofters and sheep and corn crakes and North Sea oil. Crikey, North Sea oil was a big part of my life in the early 70s when, I, when they wanted to build oil rig yards everywhere around Scotland. So it was a chance to bring things out, but there are lovely things we've done and we are doing, you know, young people. But it is this business of how do you encourage the young? And my advice to the young is be determined, never say if, always say when, and you have to be good at getting around senior people who try to stop you. Something you've done magnificently because you have again and again achieved extraordinary things that we now have ospreys as regular breeders back at Rutland Water, obviously in partnership with many others. We have ospreys becoming an established species again on the south coast. We have white-tailed eagles becoming an established species on the Isle of Wight and they will spread further from there. We have um, ospreys becoming established again in the northwest of Spain. And that brings me to a question that Alan Wheels asked. I'll read this one out to you. Alan okay. asked, what gives the impulse to an osprey for migration? And how does it suddenly start feeding itself with fish if up to that point the parents, and in some cases Roy Dennis as parents, have been doing the feeding? So what's the impulse for it to migrate and how does it know suddenly to start feeding itself? Well, the further north they live, they just have to migrate. You know, our, our locks are frozen, so they have to migrate. But the important thing is that that breeding season you know, the young ones start to fly and then the female leaves and then the young ones put on a huge amount of fat. When we ring them in the nest, they may weigh 1500 grams. The male bird feeds them during that five weeks. And by the time they're ready to leave in early, late August, early September, they could weigh over 2000 grams. So their bodies are covered in fat under the skin. And that is fat that will get them to West Africa. So there's this tremendous urge. But the interesting thing is that they all go individually. The mother, the oldest one after five weeks, then the next one, finally the little one if there's a brood of three, and then some days afterwards the male. And they all head in the right direction. And what was very encouraging was when we did the first reintroduction to Rutland Water, the birds did go to the right place, even though we had given them a four or 500 mile start. Now they're so well fed when they leave Scotland that the first fish they probably catch is in the estuaries of North Spain or Western France. And if you've ever been there in autumn, these estuaries are so full of mullet that a young osprey could near enough dive in the water with its eyes shut and it would catch a fish. <laughs> so really the food, that amount of fat allows them to get over these difficulties. But there are some that are just useless at finishing and they don't make it. But that's natural selection and that's part of, yeah. the, part of the process. Now, just before we get to our next question, you've reminded me of a lovely, because as you say, there are lots of charming and uplifting stories in your book and there's a particular female osprey whom you've known for a very long time and in fact you not only know her at one nest site and then discover her once she's been deposed at another nest site but you also find her wintering site which isn't quite where you might expect it to be. Yeah that was Green Jay and um, she was the very first bird that I put a satellite radio on in 1999 and that was thanks to Anglia Water, who we were doing the project with at Rutland Water, and they agreed to find some money for some transmitters. And it was the first time that an osprey had been sat tagged. And I and the others expected it to go down through France and Spain and on over the Sahara and into West Africa. And it only got as far as extra Madura, and it stopped. And I thought, that's really interesting. I'll go and see if I can find it. 
And so I went down there in September or October, probably October, I can't remember now. And um, I knew where it was and I wandered around and suddenly I saw it flying along being chased by jackdaws. And when I looked at it with my binoculars, I could see the radio. Now that bird lived to 25 years old. She produced young ones, which went to Rutland Water, to Andalusia, uh, and uh, I think Switzerland, and to North Spain. And she continued to rear young throughout that long life. And right near the end, we put a radio on her again, and she went back to the same reservoir in Extra Madura. How extraordinary, and also how beautiful that she has woven her way through 25 years of her life, but continues to do so because her offspring and grand offspring continue to be part of oh, your yeah. introductions. And there is even now, although this spring, it, I found it really sad, um, but I lived in a fortunate place, that I couldn't go around and see all these old ospreys that I knew. And I always, in the spring, looking at that first bird back at different nests, and you look through the scope, and you see that brilliant yellow eye staring through the other end and think, oh, you're back again having a look at me. <laughs> it was just a lovely feeling in the spring. Let's keep our talons crossed that next spring you'll be able to do so and there'll be no restrictions on our movements. Now, I'm going to bring in a very special question answer. David, could you bring in Brigitte, please? Now, this is Brigitte Strawbridge, whose wonderful book, Dancing with Bees, will be the subject of one of our conversations later in the year. And you can find the details of that on our website, which is norfolkwildlifetrust.org.uk. Now, I believe you're live. Brigitte, what's your question, please? for Roy. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Ah, oh, hello, Roy. Hello, Nick. Um, so first of all, I want to say I am so enjoying your book and learning so much from it. So <laughs> thank you for writing it. And I marked a little um, passage when I was reading your chapter, Quiet Pride Over Red Kites. So you're talking about red kites, but the bit that got me is when you were talking about the feeding of garden birds and you say, I'm generally not keen on feeding birds and have always felt uneasy about the huge amount of non-native food such as peanuts that are fed to birds in Britain. So I just wondered because um, we do feed our garden birds. It's one of my greatest joys during lockdown was watching the birds on the feeders right outside the window. And um, I just wondered if you could expand on that because it's it's made me think oh I'm not quite sure about this anymore <laughs> so that's my question <laughs> yeah that's an interesting question that I've been asked many times and um, what I will accept is that to have birds close to your house at feeders gives great joy to people and helps them um, many of them don't have the opportunities I have so I can see that but what I worry about feeding is that it masks the damage that we've done to the land. That if we haven't got enough food for birds, instead of feeding them seed for finches and so on, why don't we have more meadows full of, um, you know, seeding plants? Why, why shouldn't every farmer in the country just have 10% of their land, which is solely for in insect food and bird food. You know, the, these are essential parts of our life. And so, yeah, I think the selling of peanuts, and I used to worry, I wonder what damage we're doing somewhere else in the world by growing all these peanuts and the cost of sending these peanuts all over the world. So, yeah, I... <laughs> I'm probably not a very good salesman for peanuts. But what I would love is to see more wild areas, it, not in the wilds of Britain, but everywhere throughout the landscape. You know, there, there are cases where people have rewilded. You know, I was, I was at Nep in Sussex not a month ago, and, and the change and the kind of 
the flowers and the seeds and the kind of food for wildlife is just dramatic. So I hope that I can see the value for people sometimes more than the value for the species. I'm very much with you there, Roy. I don't feed birds in my garden because I worry about, I, I would prefer to create a garden which feeds birds and other wildlife itself, even though my garden is small, rather than import food with all of the impacts that go with it. Now we have a question, a slightly, it'll lead us into a, perhaps a contentious direction, but Catherine Miles asks, I doubt you have been to see the bearded vulture, but she asks whether you've been to see the bearded vulture in the Peak District. But then she asks, more importantly, will we see an end of raptor persecution without wild, wide scale land use and land reform? I, th I think that more and more people, and I, I'm talking now about more and more people that hunt and live on the land and farm and it, so on, are recognizing that this is just not something that should be done in this present time. It's, it's just a, a black mark on the country. So I think it, you know, it's rather like when I was young and I was in the RSPB and the stealing of eggs and the stealing of young falcons was rife. And it's near enough all gone. I don't think any kids are going out there now collecting birds eggs like I did when I was 10 and 11 years old. So some of these things are societal changes. I think the bigger one is you wouldn't have some of that problem if the large hunting estates were more ecological and recognized that what they do on their land has a direct impact downstream on villages through floods and erosion and all of that sort of thing. But also that just to have it for red grouse means that you're losing huge bio biotic, you know, biological productivity which is essential, as I explained, and you explained before, Nick, um, for our future on this planet. So I do see that. As regards the bearded vulture, I did write about it in my um, book because there was one a few years ago. And that one was on Dartmoor. And I explained that a bearded vulture coming to Britain would be like us going into a supermarket with no food on the shelves because we clean up. All the farmers have to clean up a dead sheep or a dead horse or whatever. And I'm a person that believes that we should leave dead animals in the countryside. And then a bearded vulture would get food. And my personal view is that sometime in the future, vultures will breed in Britain again. Let's hope that that is very much the case. And of course, you do touch on the theme of the nutrients that come from um, carcasses. I'm just looking for a quotation, but there's a, there's a wonderful one. Here we go. Um, the important thing about predators is that they do not eat all of the animals they kill. They can leave quite often as much meat and carrion in situ as they eat. This is then available to a whole range of carrion eaters from eagles, kites, ravens, foxes and martins down to burying beetles. They also kill through the year and they kill randomly throughout their home range, which is your own words but illustrating the self-same point that you just made. And jumping back to what you were saying about this British myth really that we are a nation of nature lovers, which of course we are, we have the largest voluntary conservation organisation in the world and yet we kid ourselves that our landscape is healthy and you write in the book it's embarrassing to have to tell foreign colleagues that the vast majority of our native forests have gone we have to do better and stop kidding ourselves that we are conservation leaders in the world we must fast track the restoration and conservation of large ecosystems to secure our nature and our future and that really is the the salient message from your book, I think, more than anything else. Now, David, could we bring in Pam Lunn, please, who has a fascinating question from a European context. Pam, can you hear us? 
I think we still are there. Perhaps. Yes, I just unmuted. Thank you. Um, I have a very good friend who is Italian and who is very, very involved and interested in all these issues we're talking about. And she talks about traditional shepherding up in the Italian mountains with these particular breeds of dogs where the puppies are raised alongside the sheep and regard the sheep as their families. They're not, they're not like we have sheep dogs to work the sheep. They live in amongst the sheep, they run with the sheep and they're big dogs and they have two or three dogs in the flock and the wolves don't come near when those dogs are there, the dogs see them off. So it, it removes one of the agricultural objections to bringing back apex predators. What will we do if the wolves and the lynx go after our sheep? Well, run these dogs with your sheep. Why is that normal in northern Italy? And it seems to be unheard of in this country. Yeah, it's not quite as easy as that because I, you know, I've seen these big white dogs in Romania and other places, uh, but there's two types of sheep. One lot of sheep, when they see a wolf, all herd together. They run together. The other sort run to the hills. And the sheep we have in Britain principally run to the hills. So our sheep are spread across big areas. And so they, that idea of having a guard dog, it doesn't work with us. But I think, you know, when you start to look at what the future would be, the future is almost certainly going to be that very large areas will not have free ranging sheep in the future. Young people, are not like their granddads. They don't want to spend all day wandering around on a mountain. They'd rather be in a van or go down the town. Um, and they, if you remove the subsidies, then that sort of farming is no longer viable. It's just really hard work. There's a lot of not, not a lot of money in it. And so, that, so there's a change there. But the one about the dogs is just not starter. I think we just have to make a decision that the wolf should return and we work out how we do it. It does after all belong here and has been here since longer than we have. We, we, it was here before we got here. Now I'm going to take you to a question from David Park which is also about a species reintroduced and a species that some people see as a threat and David asks in the Chilterns one is never alone from a red kite. Have the conservationists overshot and produced too many and what should be done <laughs> yeah that's difficult the red kite reintroduction has gone extremely well and um what people like me are my my view was that birds that were really rare we should have them as common as they can be but as they become commoner it may be that situations change and that you don't need to put such intense per protection to certain species but what you would have to say then with regard to red kite would be what are the natural predators of red kite and one of the natural predators of red kite would be golden eagle and the golden eagle should live throughout england and not only on the high ground. It should be in places like the New Forest, in the Brecks, you know, in many places. And then you would start to rebuild some of these, uh, you know, kind of predator-prey relationships. And there's no doubt in my mind that golden eagles would kill young kites. And you would start to get some sort of control. You make that point very eloquently in the book. If control is needed. Yes. Myself, I feel kites being largely scavengers of pheasants and rabbits off roads, they, they're not really doing any, any harm. But to go back to your eagle, eagle point, you say in the book, a frequent mistake made even by eagle experts is to assume that golden eagles are solely an upland species. The species has that distribution because of persecution and disturbance by humans for many centuries. We must think of the golden eagle in a new way if we are to understand the pre-persecution range in Britain. Now, I'd like to bring in someone very special to me. I have, a, I have to 
declare an interest here. We have a question from Ella, who is age nine. Now, when I first met Ella, when she was six, she declared to her dad, who is my very, very dear friend, Jerry, who is the wildest dad you will meet and a massive advocate of rewilding. Ella declared, I would like Nick to be my godfather. Um, so this is a child whose wild nature I feel very invested in. So David, can we bring in Jerry Kinsley so Ella or Jerry can ask a question to Roy? <clears throat> Ella, can you, are you live? I've still got a blocked microphone there. So we need to unblock Jerry's microphone. There we go. Think you're live now. Have we got Jerry or Ella? Are you there? Have we got Jerry or Ella? I don't think we have. This is a shame. I'm going to, since we're not getting a, a sound from them, I'm going to read the question from okay. Ella, who is age nine, and she asks how children, and she of course is nine herself, should advise parents on allowing children to live closer to nature? God, that's a good question. It's, it's really encouraging parents to give children more space, more responsibility. You know, when I was her age, and I lived in Hampshire, I'm sure by nine, we were just disappearing into the woods. And we reappeared at lunchtime. And it, in the darkness, as the evening was coming on, you hear our mothers shouting to us to come home, get washed and ready for school. But they didn't seem to worry that we went off bird's nesting, or I'm not suggesting she goes bird's nesting, uh, but um, looking at, tadpoles and newts and and building dens i love it that i have a young daughter who's now 11 and um, she builds a den down on the river and i tried teaching her things like we built a dam in lockdown so that the frogs had a place to have their their frog spawn so yeah children need to be taken out and allowed to get on with it you know i'm a believer that you know, they should have a knife to cut sticks and light fires and, you know, sample nature. Yeah. Well, I can assure you, knowing her very well, that Ella is a flagship for that very attitude. She does wield a knife in the woods and she does cook her own food over the fire and she does camp out in the woods and she is a thoroughly, thoroughly wild child. So she perhaps will be carrying Roy Dennis's vision on into the future. Now, Roy, we're running out of time. So I'm going to bring you back to my own experience of your reintroduction project. On the 4th of, no, the 5th of April, I was sitting just here in my back garden, as I did right through the lockdown because we had such beautiful weather. And I saw many wonderful birds fly over my garden. And I was reading one day and I looked up and I saw a buzzard up the tail of a ginormous bird of prey. And in that split second, and it was literally a half second, I knew I was seeing a first year white-tailed eagle. And the very next day on your blog, you published a map of the movements of the released birds from last year. And it was G324 who became my white-tailed eagle because I had the enormous privilege of seeing her over my back garden. So tell me a little bit of how G324 is doing and how her cohort are doing. It's Tim McCrill that puts all those uh, <laughs> things up on there. Uh, I think she is in the Lammer Mirrors in East Lothian. Wow. So we have one bird on the Isle of Wight, one bird in Norfolk at the present time, one in the North York Moors, and one over the border in Scotland. And that sort of um, behavior in their first year is kind of normal. They're kind of learning. And many of them have done round trips to Norfolk from the Isle of Wight and then gone back. But I think one of the loveliest things of the project, you know, which we did with Forestry England on the Isle of Wight, was so many people saw it during lockdown. 
because it's a huge bird to pass over your land, your thing. And it was just a joy of all these emails coming in and Tim managing to fit them to a particular bird. And uh, I think the most amazing one was one of the big demonstrations at the Houses of Parliament last autumn. And some boy, a, a young boy looked up and said, Dad, there's a really big bird up there. And right over the Houses of Parliament was one of the white-tailed eagles. And this man managed to get a picture with his iPhone. And it was one of our birds, and it was 2,000 feet up. And that just those two people saw it. So it was looking down on what to them was ancestral sea eagle country, the Thames. Would have been a brilliant place for breeding white-tailed eagles long ago. And as I say, someday both osprey and white-tailed eagle will breed along the Thames, somewhere within the bounds of London. Which is a fantastic vision. And it is thanks to, obviously, your work with many, many other colleagues, but to the passion and dedication that you have shown throughout your long career in conservation. And what is so inspiring, in addition to your vision, is the fact that you're not slowing down. There is no, there is no stopping Roy Dennis from rewilding, from reintroducing, from bringing the wild back into our lives. And we, I'm sure absolutely everybody watching is extremely grateful for that. So from all of us, thank you very, very much for entertaining us this evening, Roy. Well, I, I think that what we feel is that so many people enjoy what we do. And I'm I'm proud that I can help people get more enjoyment from wildlife. Well, on all of our behalf, thank you. And just a reminder that Roy's latest book, Cotton Grass Summer, is out and is available in the link, which is at the side of your screen in the chat. It's also in the email that you received with the link to this conversation. If you have enjoyed this evening's conversation, as I certainly have, and would like to make a donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, you can do that also through a link which is in the email you've received and another thank you email that you'll receive and in the chat. And a final note that our next conversation will be with Dr. Erica McAllister, who is a fly specialist, a dipterologist from the Natural History Museum in London and we look forward to speaking to her on the 10th of September. So with huge thanks to Roy Dennis, thank you all very much for taking part in our discussion this evening and good night. Bye-bye.